stepping on something here. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sean, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Sean. We'll uh, look at my phone periodically to give you guys hope. Uh, hello. Where to begin? Thank you, Justin, for introducing me. Um, Justin is a lifelong friend of mine, and uh, I'm grateful to have you um, and all the folks in my life. I'm so lucky. I couldn't, couldn't have scripted it better, couldn't ask for more. Uh, God has been very good to me um, in this life, and, and yeah, I, I come to you hum humble, I hope, or I feel humble anyway, when I'm in the room with these folks, and, and very grateful for sure. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start at the beginning. I was looking at, on the wall over there, and it said First Baptist 100th anniversary was 1979, that's when I was born, June 16th, 79, Chicago, Illinois. Um, and I was actually adopted. I didn't live there for any length of time. I was adopted when I was four days old uh, by whom I call my father and my mom, who, who uh, is no longer with us. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, I didn't even know I was adopted until I was about 12. So, you know, I've had shrinks ask me if, you, if I felt anything about that or whatever. I will say, uh, always kind of felt a little odd, a little out of place, a little behind, whatever. Um, and uh, I, I've, I've noticed that that's one thing that a lot of people have said in their open talks in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's something that I always connected with. So that pathological sense that I'm, you know, not in the right place was definitely something that somehow got to me. Um, I don't know if it's genetic or not or what, if it's part of my alcoholism, I can't really tell. But that was definitely there. Um, I grew up in a very loving household, uh, really. You know, great, great parents, the greatest folks I could ask for. My mother adored me. Um, and I was kind of a mama's boy. And she passed away um, when I was eight years old. I'm sure that was a contributing factor for me. I don't know if that had anything to do with my alcoholism either, but I do remember feeling very different and just insecure from the beginning. Uh, my parents moved to D.C. from Chicago almost immediately, um, and they moved me with them, obviously. Uh, so I didn't live in, in the Chicagoland area at all, really, but uh, I spent about 12 years in D.C. as a kid. Um, and it was a pretty normal existence until my mother passed away. And, and I think looking back, my father just did the best he could uh, with what he had to offer. You know, he was trying to cover a lot of bases. Um, I had a little brother by then. Um, I've got a little brother who's about three and a half years behind me. So he would be 42 now. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it was a... Uh, a crazy time for us for a while there, but my my mom, my father is one of those people um, who cannot be alone, so he remarried very quickly, and we got lucky with this woman. She was a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, she was I kind of liken her to our North Star, um, and I won't get into all the family dynamics back then, but you know um, there wasn't any alcoholism, I don't think, um, to my knowledge. My grandfather had got sober by then, but I never got to see him as an alcoholic. Um, he was a very interesting man, and uh, he was my grandfather on my mother's side. He was with the CIA, um, and you know, as we live around the district, you know, that was kind of what he did. And I don't remember any of that, but I, I always connected with him naturally. He was, I was kind of his favorite and whatever, and there was just a bond there. Uh, but really, no even discussion of it. Um, my first encounter with an alcoholic, other than the bums in Baltimore, um, would be my next door neighbor's grandfather. Uh, he had been stationed in Guadalcanal and had a really rough time over there. And uh, he would just drink around the clock pretty much. And by the time I met him, I don't know, I want to say he was in his 60s. And he and his wife, my, my best friend's grandfather back then, were. Um, pretty low functioning and staying with my friend's parents. And so we hid his bottle of liquor. We knew it was bad for him. That's all I remember. Uh, but we hid it one day and he threatened to shoot us. And it looked like he meant it. So uh, he's what I thought an alcoholic was. Um, 
And I just remember thinking, ugh, look at that guy. And uh, as time went on, um, we moved down here when I was 12. This would have been 1991. We, well, I say down here. We moved to Raleigh when I was 12 in 1991. And uh, <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was culture shock. It was a different world for me, definitely. Um, and the, the thing that was really interesting, you know, now that I think about it here was it was my, my introduction to alcohol and alcoholism. And I'm somebody that... Um, I had another habit, but really alcohol was center stage. I just, from the beginning that I found it, I just, I loved it. Um, there was a boy down the street named Jake. Jake was a year ahead of me. His father was an alky. And his father had one of those home brewing kits before it was popular, you know? So it was just, just rig in his garage, and it spit out really fancy beer, or lager, he called it. And... Uh, I remember him getting together with my uh, my folks. They were having like a, you know, they were grilling on the back deck one night. And they, you know, like, hey, why don't you all come over? We're going to play some vinyl records and, you know, uh, drink a couple beers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And my old man was one of those folks that would drink a beer, maybe two, on a really hot day at dinner. But that was really it. And he often wouldn't finish them. And by then, I'd had a couple of swigs, but that was really it. And this particular night, Jake snuck a few of those beers from his father's cooler and took them upstairs to my room, and, uh, and we started drinking. And then we snuck a few more. And I remember getting about three or four of them in, and I found out what everybody was talking about. Um, I felt at ease in a way that I'd never felt before in my life. And that the muscles in my forehead, you know, they relaxed and my shoulders would, you know, no longer tense. And I was just home. And I never forgot that. I was like, we got to do this again. And I remember getting sick and, and vomiting. Um, I think I stopped at four, but I, I'm not sure. Um, I know I definitely got drunk. And once that's happened to you, if you're like me, you don't ever forget it. So um, we pretty much set out to be weekend warriors from the, from the beginning, like a lot of people. You know, I'm 13 years old or something, you know, and we're, we're sneaking what we can and having fun. And I was uh, not a bad kid, but I was definitely kind of mischievous and sneaky, which helps, you know, as you probably know. And we got caught, um, a bunch of us, or a handful of us anyway, uh, drinking and driving down by the Meredith College exit in Raleigh, um, real close to NC State, the Hillsborough Street exit. There was a DUI checkpoint. And it was the 90s, you know, it wasn't, nobody freaked out really. They told our parents, they came and got us, we were in trouble, all that stuff, right? And uh, no harm, no foul kind of thing. That was the way it was looked at back then. Now they lock folks up, like all the time. I didn't know that. Uh, uh, but uh, but back then it was it was kind of just you know it was mischief or so we thought. Um, since then, uh, what ended up happening was it kind of seemed like I could hang, hold it together. I don't know every four, five, six months, and then I would just really screw up big. I would do something to just torpedo everything in my family life, school, whatever. That's just the way it went. And by that following year, I hit high school, and it, I was pretty out of control, pretty fast. Um, I didn't think I was an alcoholic or anything like that. I just did what everybody else was doing. It was fun. It was what, we, what you did when you were young. And um, <clears throat> as time went on, um, that same rhythm kind of happened. I would kind of maintain a little bit, and then, bam, I would just ruin everything. Um, I showed up for my driving test at the DMV, a little tipsy, and I hit a red Ford Ranger. Um, I start drinking pretty much every day. Um, I get thrown in a couple of rehabs. You know, you guys know the story. Um, and I'll tell you about the, you know, one of them in particular. Uh, that fellow Jake had gone to rehab, and I remember thinking to myself, man, that's, this guy's off his rocker. He's off the deep end. This is crazy. He's in a, in a place. For, for people who, 
you know, do this kind of stuff. And I remember the following year being sent to rehab and I'm on the side of this mountain in a tent and there's a little piece of paper that falls out as I'm unfolding this tent and setting it up. And it says, this tent needs water seal, bad, Jake. And I was like, and I'd love to tell you that I came to my senses and things changed, uh, but not at all. Um, I wound up hanging with some kids that were older, they were going to state and uh, a little bit more established than I was. And um, I pretty much, I got thrown out of school shortly thereafter again. Uh, for the second time, and I just disappeared for months. I don't even know what happened, I don't, or I don't know all that happened. I know that I wore out my welcome at a, a buddy of mine's mother's place who drank around the clock. I loved to be in there because she was an alky, and uh, her oldest son was also an alky. He was like 30 at the time, and wasn't hitting on much, and wasn't headed anywhere very fast, and he loved to drink, and I loved to drink with him, and he and I became close. Um, And I like to keep folks like that around me. And I don't know about anybody else, but in my case, I had two sets of friends. I had uh, had my good friends, the folks that behaved well and did everything right and were pretty sensible. And, um, and you know, my favorite one was a guy named Sam Aldrich, a sharp guy, and uh, doing well today. Um, And then I had my other friends, my loser friends. Losers are my favorites. (laughs) And the reason losers are my favorites is losers always have an open schedule. Uh, they're flexible. They've got nowhere to be and no commitments to maintain or keep or anything like that. And so that's what I became really, really fast. And so my loser friend, was, the thing about them was they were exciting and they got my heart racing. And we were always going to get into something. We didn't know what it was, but that's where I was headed as quick as I could get because I wanted to be anywhere than where I was. I had not known contentment for a very long time at that point. Um, <clears throat> the long story short, I wind up drinking like a lot of us do, around the clock as much as I can. I got a couple part-time jobs. I dropped out of school. Um, I'm supposed to, you know, I made a, struck a deal with my old man that I would pay for car insurance and, you know, the rest of my bills, you know, which were minimal. It was the 90s. There was no cell phone yet. You know, if you were, if you had a mobile phone, you were wealthy and you were paying five bucks a minute kind of thing. And it was a different world. So it was real cheap to live back then. Problem was, I was supposed to play, pay, play car, pay car insurance. And I never paid it once. And I like to drink and drive. Um, and I don't know why I'm so confident when I'm driving. I'm a terrible driver, sober. Uh, I'm even worse drinking. And so the thing about it was, in my case, um, I played bumper cars a few times. Uh, and, I, and I really, you know, was playing with fire. Uh, what ends up happening in my case was I go and I find this guy to live with who also was another alky um, and I'd burnt the last of my bridges or was burning them up quick anyway. He had a place over by NC State and he, there were two recliners in this room upstairs. He kind of rented like a, the upstairs half of this town home and he let me stay there. He had drank his way out of his license at 24, 25, well, yeah, 24 at the time. And um, I think I was 19. Uh, and he, um, I had a car still. Now that car, you could see all the wrecks I'd been in because they were all over the corner panels. And, um, you know, that thing would leak oil from like one block to the next just about. You know, you could see it happening. And it would smoke here and there, all that. It was, it was pretty beat up. And I was just kind of barely hanging on. But I, I loved it because in those two recliners upstairs, if I could just make it home from work every night, we would drink. And we would drink until we would just pass out and watch MTV. And back then, MTV was cool. MTV had actual music on it. There were videos and, you know, all that stuff was going on. And we would talk about what everybody else needed to do differently. <laughs> and um, and then sometimes, you know, we did, we'd end up, you know, Uh, whining and talking about how things were going to be different tomorrow. Um, And what ends up starting to happen to me was I wind up in rehab again through the courts. Um, I've got charges I'm facing, just BS tickets and whatnot. Um, Nothing too serious at this time, but I've definitely pushed my luck. And so 
uh, I'm thinking I might wind up going to jail temporarily. And there was some other stuff that I was worried about. Well, <clears throat> I have to come to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings because I have to get my piece of paper signed from the courts and prove that I'm going. So I came. Um, and I would, you know, I would kind of do my time, you know, once a week maybe. Uh, and what ended up happening was I noticed that at first all of you were way too excited about not drinking. I was not excited at all about not drinking. Um, I thought the, the, you know, the idea of, of not drinking and then also working was about the most miserable proposition you could come up with, and I didn't understand why any of you did it. And I felt like you were foolish, and you just didn't get it. Uh, but I came. I, uh, I wound up hitting bottom July 5th, 97, or July 4th, 97. I burnt the last of my bridges. And there was a limo involved and, um, you know, drinking with my buddies and all that stuff, and it was bad and whatever. And uh, uh, it resulted in the most unglamorous bottom you could ever think of. I wound up in the boonies with my parents in a place where I was confronted at every turn and every time I walked downstairs with all my bad history. And by then, I'd become an abusive alcoholic. Um, I was really kind of a borderline abusive drunk. And my stepmother couldn't, sta uh, couldn't stand me. And I remember her coming to me and saying, I'm going to leave your father. And I'm going to leave your father not because there's anything wrong with my marriage, but I can't stand the sight of you any longer. You come in here and you're drinking and uh, you're drunk and we can't even be civil to one another. And I'm not going to live this way any longer. So I would tell him, I would give him an ultimatum, but he'll choose you every time, Sean. And I just remember thinking low, you know, I felt as low as I'd ever felt. Um, and then here was the thing. I still have to go to those damn meetings. And the only thing at that point that my father was willing to do for me any longer was to take me to meetings. So I went to him for about a week or so before I wound up in an Oxford house. I don't know if you guys have Oxford house out here. I'm sure you do. We had a, we had a few in Raleigh. And it was a really good experience for me. But... What ended up happening was, um, I, you know, my folks, my family had written me off at that point, and they didn't know what to do with this problem I had. And they tried, you know, they, they got me help or did the best they could, but I wasn't ready. And um, being there, stuck in that place like that, and then having to come to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings anyway, you folks were not sick of my stuff yet. You know, everybody else in my life that I faced was and rightfully so. And so I began to slowly kind of look forward to this. Um, and so I started coming to more and more meetings and I didn't quit drinking, um, but at this point in my life, um, I'm waking up about every morning and saying to myself, it's gonna be different today. Today's gonna be the day. And we all have had that conversation with ourselves. And at 7 a.m., 6.30 a.m., I really meant it. I really, really did. About 2, 3 p.m., then it was, well, maybe I'll just stop by Brass Taps. Maybe I'll stop by Pantana Bob's and check on so-and-so. I need to go see John. And I would go, and I'd wind up drinking again. And mind you, I did not want to quit alcohol. I really did not want to quit alcohol. Alcohol was the best thing that ever happened to me. I loved it. And it seemed to love me, too. And the thing about it was... <clears throat> What I didn't realize back then was by the time I started that obsession and started thinking about, well, maybe I should go here, or maybe I'll go see so-and-so, or maybe I'll stop by Brass Tass. By then, I'd already lost the battle. I didn't get it. I didn't understand. But the, the, the decision was already made. And I thought that I was going to be able to get to a point where I would get to have, you know, I don't know, eight, nine beers over, you know, a three or four hour period and be okay, you know, or maybe just a few shots or whatever, you know. I could live with any of that, as long as it wasn't wine. Um, but having said that, it just, it didn't work out that way, as we all know. Um, one day, there was a man at the Hills Group in Raleigh, and um, his name was Doug. And he said to me, he said, you know, Sean, 
when you get hit by a train, it's the engine that kills you, not the caboose. I didn't know what he was talking about. I was like, what is this? What are these redneck riddles? Like, <laughs> this guy. And um, what he meant was it was the first drink that gets me. It wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't the seventh or the eighth or whatever. And so, um, and I'd hear, heard people say things like that before. It's the first drink that gets you. Or if you think it's tough staying away from the first drink, try staying away from the second. Um, and one day I went in, went in there and it, it just, it made all the sense in the world. Um, I still did not quit drinking. And I started to, what I noticed was, I had been ashamed of a lot of things by that point. I had a whole lot that I was carrying around. And um, <clears throat> it affected my life in every way. And I was just miserable. And what I noticed is that there are people here, or there were people in Alcoholics Anonymous that I saw that would talk about some of the things I did in meetings. And I was just amazed that they would share that stuff openly. But not only that, they didn't suffer like I did with those things. They were free, and I wanted that really bad, and I didn't understand what it was. I couldn't have asked for it. I didn't have the English words to give you to request it had I known what it was at the time. I didn't, I just was so in a fog at that point that I didn't get it. But I knew I wanted that. And life just didn't seem as difficult for those people as it was for me. They seemed to just kind of go through their day, and they would often be smiling. And there was just this levity that so many of them carried that I did not have and had not seen or experienced in quite a while. And so one day there was a place went that I used to kind of sober up at or say I was sobering up at. Um, it was like a Waffle House, but it wasn't a Waffle House. And I don't know if, I mean, it was decorated like a Waffle House. It was like a little coffee shop like that, like a short order breakfast place. And it was on Glenwood Avenue in Raleigh. And it was, um, they, were talk, they would talk to me a lot of the time about um, people, places, and things. You know, they'll get you drunk before you get any of them sober and stay away from your old friends, your drinking buddies, and whatever. I'd heard that stuff, but I didn't listen at all. And so there I was going to a place that I always went to, and I'm sipping some coffee, and in comes a guy that I had known for years. And he looked different. He just looked different, he acted different, he seemed really confident and relatively happy. And I said, well, what are you doing? Where you, you know, he started to leave. I said, where are you going? He says, well, I'm going to go to Valley. And I was like, he said, you should come. And uh, I was like, what's Valley? He's like, it's a meeting. And I was like, how does he know? And so I went. And he didn't, you know, we hadn't even got to talking about meetings really yet. But I went with him. Um, and if you don't know this, you probably do. Probably all of you do. But... I didn't know this for, for quite a while. In the big book, there is a very, very prescriptive method and way that we present Alcoholics Anonymous to somebody who may want it as a prospect if they want it. So he was really careful and methodical about doing that with me. He did not say, I'm better now. He did not say, I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous even. He did not say, I'm practicing the 12 steps. None of those things. He said, you should come check it out. And that's all I got out of them. So I went. And, um, and we can talk about that some other time. I want to get sober here. But I went. And there were men there. Once again, they, were, um, they looked good. They were happy. They were, you know, living well. You could tell that they were, didn't suffer like I did. And to see him, somebody that I actually knew, fit in with those people and be a totally different person than I had known even a year or two ago left me with just a little bit of hope. And it was the first time I identified with anybody. Because like I said, when I got here, I didn't have gray hair yet, but everybody there did. Uh, I was not driving an Acura or wearing a gold watch or whatever, playing golf, and all them were. And um, everybody was happy and smelled good and all that, not me. And so it was the first time that I saw past all of that stuff and actually connected and understood and identified as somebody who might be like them. And, um, and so I began to think, well, maybe they know something I don't. And so I started to go, you know, people would say things to me like, just don't drink today. Can you make it the rest of the day? And I'd say, well, I think so. And they'd say, well, meet me here tomorrow. Now, by that point, 
I should tell you, I had been out of rehab, I don't know, a couple months or so. Um, and I remember very vividly detoxing once before that. And man, it was hell coming off of alcohol like that. It was, the, it was awful. And I knew I didn't want to go through that again. And I was afraid. <clears throat> but long story short, I wound up getting through all that. I got sober. I start going to, uh, I start going to these meetings. And it was kind of a game at first of just hanging on until the next meeting. Um, and I could do that. I could, I could just kind of hang on until I ran into so-and-so the next day. And, uh, and you know, I didn't say much at first. I definitely didn't tell the truth. And, but it was enough to kind of get me by for temporarily. So I kept going. Um, and slowly I started, you know, days started adding up. And, um, and things started changing. Uh, I did the same thing I always did in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and you can kind of... You kind of get what you come for in Alcoholics Anonymous. You find exactly what you want, and that's what I did. I found the, the, a pack of losers like no other in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I hung with them. But I also had these other folks that I really liked and admired, and I was kind of torn there for a little while. And one of them in particular was a man. Uh, he had dreadlocks before it wasn't cool, and uh, I met him at what we call the Camel Club. And um, he was just an interesting guy, and I looked up to him, and he was really, 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 really committed to, to staying sober. And he would talk about his sponsor, and he would talk about, well, my sponsor's got me doing this. He told me to do this, or he said this. And he just had all these, he had an answer for everything from this, this sponsor who he presented to me as like an oracle, you know? And I, uh, I started to think, well, maybe, maybe I should get one of those. And somebody told me I should. Uh, and I went to a meeting called Early Risers in Raleigh. And there was this old blind man there. And he was loud, and he was the best dressed in there, but he was blind as a bat. He had somebody kind of guiding him around. And after I introduced myself, he came up to me after the meeting, and he said to me, um, he said, I'm going to be your AA sponsor. And he handed me a business card. And on that business card was no business there wasn't anything stated on there other than his name and his number. And he said, call me every day. And I said, okay. And really, honestly, I was afraid to disappoint the guy because he was really loud and he was very sure of himself and he was very, very, everybody seemed to love him. And so I called him every day. And mostly I would whine. I would, uh, I would whine about what was happening in the Oxford house. I got a job. I'd whine about the job, whatever the case was. And he gave me a big book after like the second time I met him. And every time I started calling him after that point, he would say, do you have that book with you? And I said, yeah. And he would say, flip it open to page 23. See if you can find yourself in those pages. And he had me read it back to him. And I'll be damned, every time I did that, whatever he was trying to make me see became real and obvious, which is really good for somebody like me because my head's in the clouds half the time and I'm kind of... I'm kind of foolish, and I can miss stuff like that. I'm not the sharpest guy around. So, but it was a great help. And things started making sense and seeming different. And he started to talk to me about the steps and how he got better. Um, when, um, uh, by the time I got to that point, I think really I had accepted that maybe I was an alcoholic and I needed help and things weren't working. Um, I had spent my life up until that point um, with the idea that men don't admit they're wrong, men don't show any fault or admit fault, men don't um, uh, admit any kind of vulnerability. So I definitely wasn't going to admit that what I've been doing wasn't working, and I definitely wasn't going to ask him for help. But somehow he knew I needed it, even though he's blind as a bat, which is amazing to this day to me. So having said all that, that first step didn't come as uh, too much of a struggle for me at first. And here's the tricky thing about that. Um, I've been through a lot since that time. My best man wound up um, staying sober for four years, and then he, he, uh, he killed himself after trying to get back for the following nine years. He stayed sober for, he relapsed, and tried and tried and tried and tried to get sober again. And I got to see that. And as painful as it was... What I noticed about him and what I see in a lot of people that I've known, and I don't want to be one of them, I hope I never am, 
is that you can really believe and be convinced and understand step one for 10,000 days in a row, maybe 20,000 days in a row. But on day 10,001 or 20,072 or, you know, 8,050, who knows? You can forget. You know, people seem to do that. And they have this idea that I know where help is if I need it and I'll come back. And if it worked that way, everybody would get sober Monday. Every damn Monday, people would just do that. But it doesn't. And so I've, saw, I've seen men with a desire to get better again, a real serious desire that really meant it, in the same way that I meant that this was going to be the first day of the rest of my life, so many days in a row at 7 a.m., and then seemed to just kind of lose it at 2 or 3. In that same way, I've seen many, many, many men do that. And that is my greatest fear as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So that's what I hope I never lose. Um, I know what it took to get me here, and there are a million ways out of here, and there are only 12 to stay. And the thing about it is, for me, what became pretty evident was that this steps, the stuff about the steps and all that they've been saying is true. And so I pressed on with my sponsor, and I didn't have a whole lot of trouble with step two. Um, it was a little confusing with me at first, kind of a, a nebulous or... Um, abstract concept, I guess. And, um, but what ended up happening was uh, primarily around my court case, my one pending court case at that time, I had a lot of fear and anxiety. You know, it's not fun to live with, you know, the long arm of the law hanging over your head. Um, and you kind of grow an equilibrium that's easily disturbed by stuff like that as you stay sober, if you're like me. And that happened to me. So it was really, really scary. And um, what ended up happening was I noticed that as I went to meetings, I would be terrified and anxious and just didn't know how I would ever get to the point where all of you were, where life was enjoyable and sensitive and peaceful. It just seemed like I couldn't get through a day without causing a disturbance or screwing up, even, even worse. But I'd make it to these meetings, and it was like God plays just the right person in my path to say just the right thing for just a five minute window that I was open enough to hear it. And I could hang on to it for another meeting and hear it again or hear it for some, whatever I needed to hear next. And as I look back, it was just enough to kind of make it another mile every time. And um, I started attributing less of these things to coincidence and started realizing, oh wow, there's no way that God isn't active in my life. And I know that that's a leap for some folks to make. But it became undeniable. Um, it, just, it just became so evident. So having said that, then came step three. Um, step three is a really, really, really big deal to me. And it was also really, really tough for me. Um, and it still is today. It's something I practice a whole lot uh, and fail a lot with too. Um, but I was to make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him. And that scared me because I still wanted to do some dirty stuff here and there, you know. I wanted to be able to have that control over my life. And I thought that if I really meant it when I said it to God, that he was going to come down and strike me good. And I didn't want to be, I don't know, I want to do that. I didn't want to be Mr. Rogers. I didn't want to be like some of my good friends. That shit looked boring. You know what I mean? And so um, I was afraid. I was very afraid. And I went to a lot of meetings and... Uh, I started going to some of these step meetings like my sponsor had told me to. And it seemed like everybody had a different uh, opinion on how to take step three. A lot of them told me to get on my knees with my sponsor. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. I don't think that that's necessarily the, the you know, what makes you or breaks you. But I think intent goes a long way. And what happened with me was, for the first time, I meant it. I was on my way down to, uh, to court. And I'm on the bus. That's always fun. And because, uh, of course, I don't have a license and I don't have a car because I got myself in that kind of situation again. And so I'm on my way down to court and I start praying. And I meant it. I meant those prayers once again. And I'm like, I know I've asked you many times before for all this stuff. And I know I don't deserve it. And I just started talking to, you know, the Almighty himself. Um, and... What ended up happening was, uh, once again, he pulled my fat out of the fire, first of all. 
But what I overlooked was first the, 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 the directions for step three are in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The last place I tried to look, um, it's very specific about how to do it. And what counts, or what turned out that it counted for me was that I made a decision and started walking in that direction. If I decide to walk home to Raleigh from right here, right now, and I make that decision, and then I start walking in that direction, which I think is east of here, right? If I keep walking east, eventually I'm probably going to get close to Raleigh. Now, I may lose my way. I may hit a storm cloud or, or break my ankle or something. And there all kinds of things may detour me. But if I resume walking, I'll probably get there. And that's really kind of how recovery has been for me. Um, so, but that decision really more than anything meant that I was going to press on with the rest of the 12 steps as best I could and give it an honest shot. So I did a fourth step, which I was ter terrified about. And for the first time, um, all the stuff in my life, the whole record was in place. And I got it on paper in black and white. And it, I wrote it down and it wasn't going anywhere. What had happened up until that point was I'd have an incident happen in my life. Usually I'd lie about something. And Sean lies when he's uh, about to get in more trouble than he can handle or he's about to be exposed for who he really is. And so um, what ended up happening was uh, I get to this point where, you know, I'm like, i got to do something. i got to do something different. And the next step is this four step. And I really don't want to tell everything to my sponsor. But i got to do this thing, and I know it, and I'm conflicted about it, right? So um, up until that point, when you asked me what was going on with me or what happened in my life or to account for whatever I did or what happened as a result of my inactivity in my own life, you got a really liberal interpretation from me as to what my part was. Things would happen. They would go in my processing center up here. They would be run through a filter that was usually full of crap, and you would get whatever distorted version of what happened that I wanted you to have. You often did not get the truth from me. And I had run out of whatever that is at that point. And so for the first time, it was in black and white. It wasn't going anywhere, and I knew it. And so I was terrified to present it to this man that I respected. And he treated me with respect, and I desperately wanted to hang on to that. And I just knew if he read this thing or heard it, in his case, because he couldn't read, he was blind. But I knew if he heard it, he would never talk to me again. And uh, he made an appointment with me. He told me, you need to be at my house on such and such a date at such and such a time. And we scheduled it. I got lucky. <clears throat> uh, he called me up um, a little bit before that day and said, hey, my sister is sick in New, in New Jersey and I got to go up to Jersey. Um, I got to go be with her and, and help take care of her. And so I'm going to have to postpone this. And that's what happened. And here's how God works in my life. Right about that time, there was a man that was new in the Oxford house with me. And he pulled me aside and he said, uh, hey, I need, to, I need to talk to somebody. I need to talk to somebody bad. Can you, can you talk to me? And so we went in the side room and I could tell he was really upset over something. And we closed the door and locked it and we chatted for a few. And he just told me the most horrendous stuff you could ever tell somebody. And it made me feel not so bad about my stuff. So I felt like I could share it with him and that's what I did. And uh, I got it off my chest for the first time ever, and I was able to share it with Freddie um, when, when he returned from Jersey, and that's what I did. Um, so I, I went through all that stuff, in a, you know, honest as I could. And some of it for me was it was so hard to say to this man that I respected so greatly, but I did it. And I got through with it. And I don't know about anybody else, but I felt awful. I felt lower than pond scum. I really, really did. And that's how I know I did a good job. I had been a rotten person for a long time, and I deserved to feel bad, and I'm not supposed to be able to feel good about that stuff, and I didn't. I felt everything that I'd been running from for so long in a day with this man. And it made me, I walked out of that place determined to not be that person anymore. I would do, do anything I had to do not to be Sean Moser ever again. I wanted a new identity. I wanted a new life. I wanted to be somebody else. I wanted to be Justin. Give me Justin. Give me Theo. Whoever. Give me Steve. I'll take three of those, but I didn't want to be me, whatever, whatever that meant. Um, and so uh, my sponsor went over steps six and seven with me in the big book and in the 12 and 12. Um, 
And that's real funny. For, that's just tough stuff for me. That's where, that's where a lot of work has really happened in my life. About that time, I got my, my girlfriend and I met in alcohol. Well, I didn't meet her in alcoholics and She followed me in alcoholics and I'm I'd been sober about two years at the time. And I didn't know she was drinking. She was going home and drinking after seeing me. And, uh, and uh, anyway, so she comes out Alcoholics Anonymous, which that wound up being fun. But um, all that said, um, we, we got pregnant. And um, it made me really want to be a different person. I was determined not to be a deadbeat dad. I couldn't th- stand the thought sober of doing that. And so I uh, set out into an unsuspecting world determined to fix my character defects. And so I started the next day, and I was, I was serious. And once again, just like with my drinking, I meant that stuff at 7 a.m. I was going to be an honest man. 7 a.m. happened. I was honest. 7.02, 8 o'clock, told three lies. And I'd call up my sponsor and be like, damn it, what is wrong with me? You know, this isn't working. And he'd laugh at me. And he's like, well, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm praying. And I was like, I, I really want to do this. And he's like, oh, so you're going to fix what God messed up. And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? Aren't I supposed to try? He says, yeah. Here's the truth. Here's what he didn't tell me. And even though he'd read it to me, I didn't hear it for whatever reason. I heard when I read steps six and seven, go be a nice guy. You can win a nice guy contest and not necessarily have done step six and seven. And what happened was I was to suffer as a result of my own bad behavior over and over and over until I was willing to let go of it. And that was was what step six looked like for me and still is today. I started to desperately cling to different behaviors and and, and really try to practice step seven. I really got sick of the results I was getting while I was trying to practice step six. And that was over and over and over for me. And it's much less nowadays, but it's those principles still are active in my life. And so um, I'll give you another example. Money. Money will tell you a lot about your real priorities, your real behavior, and in my case, my alcoholism too. If you chart my behavior with money next to my alcoholism, they're almost identical. And so those are areas in my case that really, really... uh, gave me a lot of opportunity for growth and to learn. Um, So anyway, I started to practice things and do things a little different because I got sick of suffering, and I didn't want my my wife and kid to suffer. Uh, So things started changing, and I saw the results, and then I got really big-headed about all of that. Um, Forgive me, I'm fat and old, so I'm going to take this off. Uh, But having said all that, um, I started to... uh, resume with the steps and I was terrified I don't know about anybody else but I was terrified with a step eight and nine I had left a lot of bad blood out there and I'd done a lot of wrong like a lot of us have and um, there was a certain side of town that I was just always uneasy about I just I just knew I'd run into somebody and I'd done them wrong and they would hold me accountable and I knew I deserved it and back then I was waiting tables and bartending uh, for a living while I was at the Oxford house. And about every night around 8 o'clock, you know, I'd get just really, really upset and, and, and just uneasy. Not upset, but uneasy. I, would, I, was, I was fearful. I knew somebody was going to come sit in my section and just stare at me. And, and you know, somebody I'd done wrong, and I knew I deserved it. And um, uh, what ended up happening was my sponsor had me write a list of people that I was willing to make amends to or unwilling to make amends to. I all needed to be on this list. And I was afraid because I knew he was going to have me start making amends to these people. I knew that was coming because I'd read the steps. I'd been in meetings. I heard people talk about it. But um, a funny thing happened. The minute I became willing to make amends to them all, it all changed. And I remember going into work one night and looking up you know, toward the end of the night. And I was like, man, I hadn't been afraid at all. It's just gone. And from that moment on, it all changed. I could look people in the eye. Now, I wouldn't have asked you to be able to do that had I known it was available to me. I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous for that. But what ended up happening was that. And I was really, really grateful that that happened. So I started to make amends. 
I sat down with my sponsor and made a script and a plan with every single one of them. And some of them I had to pay money. Some of them still won't talk to me today. Um, there are a couple, three of them out there that, you know, one guy moved to Africa. Um, but my job was to hold myself willing in case one of them surfaced. Matter of fact, the guy that went to Africa did show up. I set an appointment to meet him and I showed up with money and he left anyway without giving me a chance to pay him back. But um, if he ever returns, you know, I'll be here. Um, the thing about it was, as I started to do all of that, I started to make right what I have uh, done wrong in the world and what the, all the broken stuff that I left out there, all the unfinished stuff. I've since had a chance to deal with people like me and it sucks and, um, uh, and that's what I get to fix. Uh, my sponsor at the time always told me, get in and get out like a thief. You state your case, you state what you're willing to do and what you can do and you do it. And whatever you do, make sure you do what you said you're going to do. And he would say the, 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 the rule of thumb is hard on us, easy on others. And I know that we're getting close to time, so I'll speed this up. I got married to that gal that I had a baby with. And um, <laughs> there, was a, there was an old guy in, in South Carolina at a meeting that I went to years later that said this best. Um, I learned about step 10, which is really helpful in marriage. Uh, this guy said, if you got to eat crow, it's best to do it while it's good and hot. And that's been, uh, been true for me, for sure, because it sucks even worse when it's cold. Uh, so uh, that's kind of been my mantra with that. I do do a regular inventory as well. Uh, and then finally, <clears throat> I wanted to make sure I touch on step 11. I went many years in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and even talking about step 11, and I'll tell you this, one thing I got right from the beginning was um, prayer was about the only thing I've done consistently other than not drink since I've been here. And I think that that has something to do with why I've been able to stay despite all my bad behavior and foolishness. But meditation is something that I let really slide for a long time. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I learned how to meditate. And I tried several different things, and what ended up, what ended up working for me was uh, learning how to, you know, focus on my breathing at first, and uh, it got better from there. But uh, that was something that I was not disciplined about. It's not in my nature to be disciplined. So I had to learn that and practice that. And what I found is if I take the time to clear my mind and meditate and get an idea, a vision of what I think God wants for me out in the world for this day, or whenever, I generally find that things go a lot smoother um, and I'm not met with or, or burdened with a lot of the anxiety and the fear and the worry that I get as a response to everyday life. Um, the other thing is this. I really think that uh, despite, and I've done, every, let, me, <laughs> let me be clear about this, I've done everything wrong twice in Alcoholics Anonymous. That poor girl that I got pregnant, you know, we got married and divorced, you know, the whole thing that we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was a good, it was actually a good experience, all of it. Um, and I've got two wonderful children out of it. One of them called me a few minutes ago. Um, but having said that, um, there was a lot, there were a lot of hard times in there. And I think the thing that sustained me more than anything was step 12. Um, I have been given a process uh, through the Alcoholics Anonymous 12 Steps that allowed me to have a method of, of living my life that I could count on and rely on. Um, and uh, I don't think it's magic. I think, uh, I think that uh, I would be misrepresenting to you what's really happening if I gave you the idea or left here today with giving you the impression that it, I went through some crucible and I did something magnificent and Here's the finished product. And I think that's what um, I see a lot of folks do in Alcoholics Anonymous. What I've been given is a process that's real simple that anybody can do um, that allows me to live a life peacefully in Alcoholics Anonymous if I stick to that process. And oftentimes I deviate a little bit from it. It's a lot less than it used to be, but I do. My sponsor, and I've been lucky to have some really great sponsors. Um, a couple of them passed away, but... Uh, um, 
I've been lucky with the men that I've met. It seems like God just sent just the right people once again. But um, they've always impressed on me to work with other alcoholics. And from the beginning, that the idea was for me to get to a point where I had something to give back to these men. And if I did that, then I just might have a chance of staying sober. Um, the chances of me staying sober another 10 years or another year, I know, are, are not great. You know, we as an organization, you know, percentage-wise aren't, you know, it's, it's we're, we're lucky. We're all very lucky to be here, and I know that. And uh, I know how unlikely it is that we'll all stay. But I want to hang on to my seat. So I am very active about trying to give back to other alcoholics. And I think that's really the thing that, uh, that kind of, links it all together and makes it all possible. Um, I w I've got a sponsor. I've got sponsees that I work with. He's got a sponsor. I know that guy. Um, and they're all great folks, and I admire them. So having said all that, thank you for having me. This has been a, a wonderful ride. I hope that yours is like mine or even better. And uh, I hope we cross paths again one time. Thank you.